And I first wanna thank you for joining Opportunities for Advancing US Human Rights Post UPR, a UNA USA Global Engagement Online Series event that's also being hosted by our UNA Human Rights Affinity Group. With the U.S. Universal Periodic Review, or the UPR, on human rights completed this past November for the United States, and with acceptance of recommendations made during that time coming up within the next few weeks, this is a great time for us to think about the state of human rights right here within our own nation. This event is being recorded and made available afterwards for you all to view. If you would like to catch any information that you missed, we are so very thrilled to have Representative Jim McGovern join us this evening to speak with Jordy Hannum, Executive Director of the Better World Campaign. And Representative McGovern is co-chair of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission at the US Congress, and he is proud to serve the Massachusetts Second District. If you have questions for Representative McGovern, please let us know by using the Q&A box found in the black bar at the bottom of the screen. But before we get to that discussion, we will hear from Joshua Cooper, who's the Dean of Global Leadership Academy for Human Rights Advocacy and advisor for our UNA Human Rights Affinity Group, as well as from London Bell, who's the founder and president of Bell Global Justice Institute and is a UNA USA National Council Regional Representative. During the remarks, you may also see some quick pop-ups or polls to kind of get a sense of your interest and knowledge of human rights, as well as the UPR. So now over to you, Joshua. Aloha, Katrina, and thank you so much. Welcome to Advancing Our Rights, a conversation on the US UPR human rights recommendations and implementations through new initiatives in our nation. The third review of the UPR was on November 9th. We are now about to wrap up on the world stage and bring human rights home after the adoption of the UPR recommendations at the current 46th session of the Human Rights Council. The UPR is a human rights checkup on how healthy the country is. The UPR allows us to have a voice about our vitals regarding our common vision for our country. And the UPR is also a full-blown examination of equality and equity of our nation. Also, the UPR makes sure every country knows its human rights rate. Sometimes ours is beating a little too fast these days but it's getting better. The UPR is also a preventative measure for a candid conversation between all segments of civil society in the country to all know our vital numbers regarding fundamental freedoms in our country. It's a regular meeting everyone should be aware of so we can all consider how we can be more human rights healthy and examine together some steps to be closer to our goals for the common good. And the UNA has contributed to the UPR process with some genuine recommendations what the government should do to guarantee human rights and the overall health of our country. It has been an exciting process. We were able to meet with our UNA chapters, get recommendations, not only saying what's wrong, but what people want. And those recommendations are from directly impacted people saying what the country needs to improve our human rights record. Then we were able to interact at that global level in unique creative ways, even throughout COVID. And there we were able to do virtual serpentine sessions, but we also met in Washington DC with embassies and also UN missions in Geneva and New York to share the voice of the people. And then that third step, the consideration was that vital one where we were able to see a record number of recommendations given to the United States regarding everything from indigenous people's rights to human rights education, to racial discrimination, police brutality, but also to point out we need to do more at home they pointed out that we need to ratify international human rights treaties, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention to Eliminate All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And what we look forward to as we move forward is seeing how we can now, after the adoption on March 17th, move towards implementation. And that's where it'll be exciting to partner with Congress because everyone knows that we can't just do it from the White House and we can't just do it from the ground we really need to work with our members of Congress to then implement these recommendations through hearings and discussions. And we're excited to see what is possible and how we can realize all human rights for all Americans. And we thank you all so much for coming and participating today.
Now, London, would you want to come in and share a little bit about uh, UNA USA, and especially from the chapter perspective, since you were very much involved with that, what did that look like, the engagement with your community and putting together these UPR consultations, as well as what was the experience of having those serpentine meetings to speak with other permanent missions to the United Nations about what our UNA USA members found to be uh, kind of the key needs within their areas regarding human rights? Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Joshua. Um, you know, I, you know, I think one of the, the best parts about uh, UNA USA uh, doing uh, this national consultation is I think, I feel like more Americans walked away uh, learning and understanding uh, the universal periodic review process and maybe wanting to learn more about the United Nations than before. Uh, yeah, uh, as Joshua was, was saying, um, we, you know, as a, as, as a national organization, uh, chapters led uh, consultations in their particular communities, big and small, uh, gathering uh, personal stories, uh, just uh, observations and con uh, uh, constructive recommendations for the United States. And, and many different areas, as Josh was saying, on gun violence, election integrity, climate change, human trafficking. Uh, in Detroit, uh, my chapter hosted three consultations on water rights, uh, LGBTI human rights, and uh, gender-based violence. And what I learned is that the community came out and, and learned about the process, but all they were very, very candid. Uh, about their experiences. And I, I, we collected a lot of information that went into the reports. And I feel like, you know, people felt like uh, their, their time mattered. Um, they also felt like they, had a, they have now have a stake in this. And so that was one of the best parts is listening to the community and giving this information about the UN and the UN process. Uh, what was also wonderful about the chapters across the country is that many of our chapters partnered to submit information. Um, we, we submitted 11 reports altogether. So several of the chapters gathered information to submit support uh, reports together, such as uh, Greater Chicago, uh, the Kentucky, UNA Kentucky, the Southern California Division, and Greater Detroit, as well as the UNA Whittier uh, chapter, we actually all conducted human rights consultations to gather information for the UPR, but we, we submitted a joint report on human trafficking and the human rights of women and girls. So it also you know, provided an opportunity for chapters to work together across regions uh, to gather information and also to work with UNA USA who hosted uh, several consultations during the Global Leadership Summit in 2019. So overall, it, it, was a, it was a great experience. I learned a lot and I know that uh, people in my community uh, learned a lot as well. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, London. Uh, and thank you so much, Josh. Uh, so now I want to take us over to uh, Jordi Hannum, who's the executive director of the Better World Campaign. And uh, Jordi so kindly is going to uh, have a really interesting conversation with uh, Representative McGovern uh, regarding uh, human rights, uh, in particular regarding uh, his experience as co-chair with the uh, Tom Lantos uh, Human Rights Commission, and really what are some uh, priorities that they're looking at uh, within this area. So Jordi, take it away. Uh, well, thank you so much, and thank you all for joining in. And it's, it's such a pleasure to be moderating this panel with uh, Congressman uh, Jim McGovern. If you're not familiar, the Congressman has been in office since 1996. As Katrina noted, he represents the second district in Western Mass, which is the picturesque Pioneer Valley. And this is actually where my wife and her family are from. Uh, they've been in the area going back five generations, running the same small dairy farm with wonderful homemade ice cream. Uh, they come from the town of, of Hadley, and it's such a notable place that we named our daughter Hadley. I actually tried to get her to join me for this, but I think she's somewhere on, on one of the Zoom screens below. But um, anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful place, and, and the congressman has uh, done a fantastic job in, in representing uh, the area. Now, on our business. For the purposes of this evening, we'll be speaking Congressman McGovern in his role, as Katrina noted, as a longtime Democratic co-chair of the bipartisan uh, Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, as well as the chair of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. 
both of which monitor, investigate, and advocate on behalf of international human rights, the rule of law, and good governance. In fact, Congressman McGovern has been called the conscience of the Congress. He is unequivocally one of the foremost voices for human rights in our government, bringing equal attention to abuses here at home and importantly abroad. I cannot think of a better person to be talking to one day after the US announced its decision to run for a seat on the Human Rights Council uh, than Congressman uh, McGovern. So I, I actually wanna start there uh, with our conversation. Congressman, again, thank you. Um, and just, just for folks on the line, if, if, you're not, if you're not familiar, but in 2018, the Trump administration withdrew from the UN Human Rights Council, a decision you, you criticized Congressman saying we were better served by, engage, by being engaged. In addition, in 2018, the administration uh, unilaterally cut its contributions to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So just yesterday, the Biden administration announced that it would re-engage with the council, run for a seat next year. So Congressman, were you surprised this announcement uh, came so soon? And why is it important? Well, first of all, Jordy, thank you for having me uh, on this uh, uh, broadcast. And uh, and you married well. Uh, <laughs> Valley. I should also point out that Hadley is the asparagus capital of the world. So if anybody likes asparagus, that's the place to go. But, but in answer to your question, look, I, uh, I'm not surprised, uh, and I welcome the Biden administration's decision to return to the council. Uh, it was a smart and it was a strategic thing to do. Um, it's important to engage and work multilaterally because we'll be more effective that way. Uh, you know, when you go it alone, um, you know, it, it limits uh, your influence. You know, it's, it's, it's just not possible and it's not desirable for the U.S. to be the world's human rights police person. Uh, and these days, we don't have the credibility, quite frankly, based on the last four years, to, to be able to play that role, even if it were a good idea. Uh, you know, human rights laws and norms have been developed collectively over many decades, and they need to be enforced collectively. Um, uh, that makes them more effective. Uh, so none of this means that the United States, you know, shouldn't, um, uh, should, you know, for some reason should stop acting bilaterally. Um, it's not one or the other. Uh, I mean, our foreign policy needs to be grounded in human rights, and we need to work with our allies to strengthen inter uh, uh, the international commitment to and the compliance with uh, human rights standards. So, uh, so I um, I support restoring uh, funding to the UN High Commissioner's Office, uh, and uh, I've always been a strong supporter of the office. And I thought it was a terrible, terrible mistake uh, that the Trump administration decided to walk away from it. So, I'm I'm, I'm happy about this. Well, uh, thank you for saying that. And, and because of you said that, I'm going to make sure that uh, you get a free pint of Hadley grass ice cream, uh, which um, I uh, in laws make every spring. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite delicious. It's kind of, uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, um, so I wanted to kind of broaden the lens a, a little bit uh, now beyond uh, the, the UN side of it and just say, as you have raised over the past couple months, of course, a couple of decades, you know, the world faces a number of critical human rights challenges, including in China, in Burma, in our own country. So as you look out over this landscape, what are your, some of your priorities as co-chair uh, of, the, of the Lantos Commission and, and some of the most urgent human rights issues, you know, for the Biden administration and Congress in the coming year? Well, first of all, um, we need to um, uh, work on human rights here at home as well. You know, some of our, human rights challenges are not just halfway around the world, they're halfway down the block. Uh, and so we need to be, uh, you know, uh, in a position where we're not just talking the talk, but we're actually walking the walk. So whether that is dealing with our, you know, immigration policy at the border, whether that's de dealing with, um, you know, policing issues or uh, criminal justice issues here at home. I mean, uh, we, are, we are more, effective and more credible around the world when we make sure we take care of some of the challenges that we face here at home. So that, that's number one. But, you know, you mentioned some countries, um, you know, that have, we've been, I've been concerned with for a long time and we're gonna to continue to track them. In China, you know, what's happening in Burma, uh, uh, you know, top uh, on that list, as well as countries like El Salvador and Colombia and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia Egypt and, and, and Russia, as you mentioned China as well. 
you know, there are, you know, there are also urgent new issues um, dealing with issues, things like climate, the climate crisis. Um, uh, that's a huge topic. And I, and I think that when we talk about human rights, the environment needs to be part of that discussion. You know, we're interested in the impacts of climate change on migration. Um, you know, why, mitigate, why mitigating climate change is important to reducing the risk, risk of conflict uh, uh, and even in preventing atrocities. Uh, and you all know, you know, the impacts that climate change have had on increasing the likelihood of conflict. Um, you know, we, we have to, we're also going to, in the commission, are going to focus on things like uh, how do you prevent atrocities? Uh, and you, uh, from you know, and genocide from even occurring to begin with, uh, to be bit more sensitive to early war warning uh, signs uh, where conflicts may be spinning out of control and to turn into it may turn into something, you know, um, you know, e even more terrible, um, uh, you know, um, and and uh, you know, and right now I'm thinking about some of the stuff that's happening in China uh, to the Uyghurs, uh, to the Tibetans. Um, you know the the what's happening um, you know with the Rohingya um, so um, you know uh, and then of course there are ongoing challenges protecting human rights defenders around the world um, you know um, you know we, we need to be wind at the backs of those who are willing to stand up uh, and speak truth to power and to call out governments that are persecuting people because of who they are or what they believe so uh, I, I, I guess the, the bad news is that there's no shortage of uh, challenges in this area and uh, we have a full play. Um, that's uh, uh, unfortunately a, a, actually a good segue into my next question, which was you mentioned human rights defenders uh, and, and you mentioned down, down the block, but actually in 2018, we partnered uh, with you for an event around the, actually the promise and peril of technology regarding right. human rights. And at the time, we discussed how it would be manipulated by governments abroad and how it was being weaponized against human rights defenders and had some defenders from, from different parts of the world. Uh, of course, the last few months have made clear how real the threat is here in the US. So how do you see the role of the US government in relation to the use of technology like social media? Are there, are there hearings uh, or legislation uh, in the works? Uh, and then I'm also wondering, could we use the Human Rights Council as a forum to demonstrate both, you, you know, the, the promise of technology and, and, uh, and how it should be used, while also making clear how it should not become a, a tool uh, for misinformation by one's government. So again, kind of, you know, technology here, hearings and legislation, and then can the, can the council be a, a forum? So I, I think it can, uh, because the the challenge with technology being manipulated is is you know is a global issue. Um, we've seen the results here in the United States. What happens when technology is abused and misinformation and lies and conspiracy theories get out? I mean, we had an insurrection uh, here in Washington at the United States Capitol on on January six, uh, and um, and I was I was in the chair, the speaker's chair. Uh, presiding over the house when uh, when the Capitol was attacked, and I came literally face to face with those who uh, descended on the Capitol, and um, and uh, you know, and I you know will never forget you know looking into the eyes of those who stormed the Capitol, actually breaking the glass windows trying to get at us uh, on the House floor, and I just commented to somebody that uh, you know these people aren't here. To uh, to protest or to hand me a leaflet, uh, they're here to, to hurt us, and I mean it was fanatical. Uh, but you know, one of the reasons why uh, populations, segments of the population, get can get radicalized in such a way and buy into conspiracies, whether they be QAnon or what what have you, um, is that um, you know if there are no checks and balances, then people begin to believe. The propaganda they begin to believe the conspiracy theories uh it's a challenge because we obviously have you know free speech issues and you know we we are very big in this country about you know not censoring anything but um but we need to find better ways to check um you know uh facts and and um you know and especially um, facts that are being manipulated you know you, you you began by talking about how your wife is from the pioneer valley
I was on a call last night with reporters and supporters of the local newspaper, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, uh, which is a local newspaper that is struggling, that is, um, you know, maybe in danger of, of shutting down or being sold to some big, uh, you know, corporate entity. But one of the points I was making is that when we lose uh, our, our local validators, when we lose those who can tell us what's happening in our community, and we kind of rely on, 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 on entities, whether it's technology or you know, corporations to tell us things uh, about, uh, about how we should proceed that have no, that have no basis in our community, you know, that's when things like January 6th can happen. So, um, so we, 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 you know, countries like Russia, countries like China manipulate, uh, you know, technology. Um, and unfortunately, it's happening here in the United States. So it's a challenge, but it's something we have to be talking about. And by the way, there have been hearings have begun in Congress to talk about how we deal with that. We may do a hearing in the Human Rights Commission on that as well. Uh, so I'm going to ask ask one more question, and then uh, just for folks uh, on the line here, uh, please, if you have questions, uh, uh, put it in the Q and A, and then we'll uh, in a moment turn it uh, to, to the audience while while we still have the congressman. So, um, Congressman, we we kind of started off uh, the the meeting today talking about the UPR, the Universal uh, Periodic Review, which again, if folks uh, uh, are not uh, familiar, it's actually one of the uh, unique aspects and really important aspects of uh, the of the Human Rights Council, one of the reforms made that the U.S. pushed for, um, and uh, which is that every country, uh, no matter how how uh, big or small, would have its human rights record uh, evaluated, you know, uh, on a staggered basis, about uh, every uh, every four years, ensuring that no country uh, would kind of escape uh, escape scrutiny. So one, I just wonder, you know, there was some debate over the past couple of years about whether the U.S. would actually, you know, go forward and, and sadly be the first country not to accept it. So were you at all concerned that the U.S. might uh, set set an unfortunate uh, precedent? Um, uh, and uh, and then were there any recommendations of uh, the the kind of past year that that uh, surprised you? Uh, but let me start there, and then just one other uh, question on, on the Unalienable Rights Commission. Yeah. So first, let me begin by saying I think the Trump human rights record was horrendous. I mean, I was ashamed uh, of their lack of commitment to human rights. Um, you know, I think he was only concerned about human rights abuses that were committed by countries he didn't like, for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, the countries whose leaders he, he liked got a pass. Uh, it, it was like a return to the Cold War, uh, which I thought we had moved beyond. Um, given that poor record, I was relieved and I was glad to see that the administration actually went through with the UPR process. Um, at the same time, uh, the report that was submitted had, had many of the problems and gaps that we saw consistently uh, during the Trump years, like prioritizing freedom of religion at the expense of most other rights and undermining women's reproductive rights. Um, and, um, you know, these same weaknesses were evident in the work uh, of the Commission on Unalienable Rights, right? Yeah, that you were talking about. I mean, I, I, opposed the I opposed the Commission, and I'm glad that uh, the report has been removed from the State Department's website. Um, but I don't think that the report itself carried much weight. Um, the, uh, the real challenge comes from, you know, authoritarian uh, regimes that want to redefine human rights and, and totally and completely. Uh, you know, China is an obvi obvious example, but, um, but it has plenty of allies, countries whose leaders can only stay in power by repressing its own citizens. So, you know, these regimes were emboldened uh, during the Trump era and uh, they gained influence uh, as the US withdrew from diplomacy and, and multilateral engagement. Um, uh, that's left us with a problem that's much bigger, quite frankly, than the report. Um, and I just say that, you know, I, um, I was pleased uh, to hear the news. I don't know if they've released the information yet, uh, that uh, the Biden seems to be taking a very different tact. Um, and uh, he's, he's agreed to release the information uh, about uh, the involvement of the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia in the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. I think that's a, that's a positive development. 
I'm sure it's for many in the establishment it's uncomfortable, but you know, if we're, we're either we're either going to uphold a high standard of human rights or we're not. Uh, we're either going to, um, you know, say that uh, human rights matters, and that, and then we're, we're going to call out not just those countries that we have issues with, but also our allies uh, and our friends. Uh, and I think that that's an important signal. I hope uh, to just more than Saudi Arabia, but to other countries that we're going to be. This is there's a new sheriff in town. We're going to be taking. We're going to be looking at these issues very, very differently. Uh, and human rights is going to be a major focus of our foreign policy. Uh, well, uh, amen. There. Um, let me uh, let me turn to, to, to the audience here. A couple couple great questions, and um, and of course, no surprise in uh, in 2020, 2021. But uh, how have you seen COVID nineteen and and the uh, challenges there? bring to light issues with human rights. Yeah, so I worry that, uh, that you know, COVID-19 is being, you know, and, and is, is being used as an excuse for some to crack down uh, on human rights and on basic freedoms. Um, you know, in the name of, quote, keeping everybody safe, uh, you know, they're limiting uh, people's freedom to assembly, people's freedom to protest or speak out or you know, or to uh, be engaged in, in, uh, in peaceful activities. Um, so I worry that countries uh, that um, have authoritarian tender tendencies, um, you, know, um, you know, will see this as yet another opportunity to exploit. Um, and, um, and so um, I think we have to be, we have to be mindful of that fact. And, um, and I, I and I, and again, I uh, during the uh, last four years, I was concerned about how this might be uh, used as an excuse to um, to somehow dissuade or silence um, um, you know dissent here in the United States. But look, COVID also highlights another issue, and that is that health uh, is a right. I think health uh, is a basic human right, and um, and you know. In this country, um, this pandemic has shined a bright light on the disparities in our healthcare system, and our disparities in, in, on, a, on a lot of areas. Uh, but here's the deal, those disparities existed even before the pandemic. Uh, and so the challenge for us here in the United States is, you know, how do we emerge from this better? Uh, and how do we emerge from this in a way where we fix some of these disparities? And that goes for the rest of the world as, as well. Oh, that's great, and and um, I like the here's the deal mention. It feels like it's uh, we got uh, uh, the president here with us. Uh, but um, let me ask uh, a question, uh, a very important one, and I know one that you have talked about and, and just introduced uh, bipartisan legislation on. But that's uh, what's happening in in Xinjiang. Um, and uh, so the question is, how can we get our leaders to acknowledge and act upon the ongoing? A genocide of, of Uyghur Muslims um, in, in China. So I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the evidence is overwhelming about what is happening there, and it is um, unbelievably tragic. Um, I mean, the Holocaust Museum has, you know, says that it constitutes crimes against humanity. Uh, people have used words like genocide. Um, but uh, however you want to describe it, it is... Um, you know, it, 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 it is unconscionable. And so, you know, I've introduced a bill called the Uyghur Forced Labor Bill, uh, and I'm gonna work hard to pass it. The, uh, the bottom line is that products that are made with forced labor have no place in the American market. And, um, you know, the, the rules that, you know, that guide companies right now in terms of doing business in, in China and around the world, I think are too loose. Um, you know, it, it, it basically gives uh, companies an easy way out of really facing the truth. Uh, and so this bill would, would put the, uh, would basically uh, say that, um, you know, there is forced labor there. And in order for you to do business in the Xinjiang region, you're going to have to prove the, the opposite. Um, and, um, and again, I, I think that it's a smart way to approach things because one of the things I've also come to believe 
over the years is that, you know, um, the targeted sanctions, you know, are better than blanket sanctions. Uh, and uh, because the whole point of a sanction is to punish those who are responsible, uh, you know, not to punish innocent people. And I think that this is targeted um, in nature. Um, I also think we ought to use the Global Magnitsky Act as well to be able to target individuals in government who are responsible for the design and the implementation of that policy. Uh, but, um, you know, but I, I you know, I, I also think that uh, it's important, you know, for the High Commissioner to visit China and Xinjiang uh, in particular. And I think the, the Commissioner should be able to visit without restrictions. Obviously, it shouldn't be choreographed by the Chinese government. Uh, there's no question that a visit like this is warranted, uh, given all the information uh, that we have seen. Uh, the commissioner, her office, our experience, and professional, I believe their findings would be useful. Uh, and again, it would be yet another very powerful affirmation about what's happening there. And, um, and I think that every country that aspires to global leadership, including the United States, and certainly China, uh, should issue standing invitations to all UN special procedures. Um, that should be a requirement for joining the Human Rights Council. And I'd I'll be encouraging our administration uh, to do this as it seeks re-election to the council. So, um, uh, you know, um, so I mean, you know, I, I was proud that we passed this bill in the house last year. Um, I I'm gonna reintroduce it this year. Uh, my hope is that we can get the Senate to get off its behind and actually do something on this and then get it, get a bill to the president. But I think this is a, I think this is a necessary and reasonable step that we got to take. Okay. Um, so I, I want to move to a kind of major problem abroad to, to one here here at home. Um, and that is, uh, of course, uh, the challenges um, racial equity, racial justice. Um, so last year, uh, about 200 organizations joined, joined uh, with the George Floyd family, submitted an appeal actually to the, the UN uh, Human Rights Council regarding racism and police brutality. So, um, particularly if we uh, run for seat and 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 win, in fact, if we are more engaged, but do you anticipate more groups submitting issues directly to the UN regarding uh, human rights violations in the U.S. Uh, and would you support that uh, those the, those kinds of efforts? I do, and yes, I would. Um, and um, and here's why. Um, you know th this. Uh, this notion that somehow, um, 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 you know, that, you know, we have one standard for everybody else and another standard for, el for us. Again, I think um, it, 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 it diminishes our credibility on these issues. Uh, and, um, and if we, we, as our government is, be in our system is behaving in a way that is unjust, we ought to be called out on it if we're not handling it ourselves. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean, I'm a big supporter of the International Criminal Court, for example. I, I, I wish we would join. Uh, this idea that, you know, we, we, we all talk about how great the court is when it's, you know, prosecuting war criminals, you know, that we all acknowledge are war criminals, but yet we won't hold ourselves to that standard. I've never understood why we are afraid of, you know, living up to the standard that we want everybody else to live up to. Uh, so, um, look, we have some real issues in this country in terms of things like systemic racism. And by the way, uh, you know, we are having a very difficult time even talking about it, which is, which is, which is, a, I mean, you can't solve problems unless you acknowledge them, unless you actually talk about them. But um, I mean, I see it in Congress. People get very defensive when you talk about, you know, systems in this country that have racial biases. I always tell people that systemic racism doesn't mean that everybody in a system is a flaming racist. It means that a system has developed over the years in which it behaves in a way that excludes certain people, oftentimes based on the color of their skin, you know, or other factors. Uh, and so we all should want to fix that. Right? We all should want to be better. Um, and we need to stop circling the wagons and always being so defensive. And we ought to open ourselves up 
you know, to um, constructive criticism and analysis. And we ought to hold ourselves to the highest possible standard. I think to the extent that we do that, it is an example for the rest of the world. And uh, well, uh, very, very well said. And, and that's actually a, a good segue in, into a question um, uh, one of the audience asked, which you basically touched on, which was, was talking about treaties and will treaties like the Disabilities Treaty, do you think it, it, it can be passed? I think um, you, you talked about the importance of holding ourselves up to the standard. Maybe I'll just paraphrase a little bit from her question is, do you think uh, there, the Senate will pass a treaty again? Uh, so whether, I mean, the Disabilities Treaty is, is, a, is a great example as it's based on US law passed by uh, uh, President George H.W. Bush asking other countries to come to our, our standard. I mean, and, and that didn't happen. Uh, what are your thoughts and just prospects for, for human rights treaties or just treaties in, in general? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I mean, I, I hope we can get to the point where we can pass international treaties. But look, this is a challenge for all of us collectively um, to counter you know, the arguments that are put forward for us not to join those treaties. That somehow, um, you know, we're so special uh, that we don't need to be held to account. That we don't need to, uh, we don't need, as I said before, you know, we can talk the talk, but somehow we're not expected to walk the walk. I mean, you know, why that kind of contradiction is viewed as a, a, a popular political position is beyond me. Um, I think that most people, um, you know, if they are informed of why joining some of these international agreements and these treaties uh, are important, you know, we'll buy into it. Um, but this, you know, we, we and look at I, I, I am, I love this country more than anything. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to serve the United States Congress. But, you know, the idea that that we are somehow better than everybody else. Um, and therefore do not have to be held to the same standards with regard to human rights and other measures, I just think is wrong, right? And I, and, um, you know, and if we wanna be a leader in the world on human rights, then we, we have to practice what we preach. Um, you know, I mean, when you look back in recent years, I mean, you know, um, I mean, you know, we have behaved in ways that quite frankly, you know, demand, call for international criticism, whether it's one, things like Guantanamo, whether it's, you know, some of the military tactics in the, in the recent wars, you know, whether it's what is happening at the border. I mean, let's, let's be honest, if any other country were separating children from their parents at their border, and then not being able to reunite their children with their parents, we'd be coming to the United Nations saying, you got to do an investigation. This is a crime, right? And yet, for some reason, people, politicians, you know, people in the Senate, people in the House feel like, well, you know, we're immune to uh, that kind of criticism. Well, we're not. You know, I, it's a crime if that was happening, you know, in a, a country halfway around the world. And it's a crime that is happening here in the United States. Uh, and, um, and again, uh, you know, maybe uh, we can benefit with a little bit more international scrutiny. Um, because maybe it might compel us to be a little bit more sensitive about how we behave here at home, as well as how we behave around the world. But it, it also may be the impetus for us to do things better. Um, let me just ask one, one more question. I know um, you, you, you need to head out. Th thank you for allowing us to co cover so much ground. But um, um, the, the audience has just asked what, you know, what, uh, guidance, advice, thoughts do you have um, that uh, for everyday Americans who, who, who care about these issues um, in terms of pushing at, you know, at the federal level, but also the, you know, the, the local and state level, what, what are some, th some things they should be uh, uh, doing? Well, I mean, we got to be louder. Um, and, um, you know, we, we need to utilize the uh, communication platforms that we have, whether it's social media, whether it's, you know, local newspapers, whether it's actually one-on-one -on -one visits uh, with uh, members of Congress or members of your local legislatures or wherever the, whoever's the most appropriate person to see on a particular issue. But, 
you know, um, you know, I have this view that, um, you know, you can't change the past, but you can help shape the future. And, um, and shaping the future is, is going to be determined by those, you know, who uh, step up to the plate uh, and, uh, and raise their voices. People need to be held accountable. When members of Congress vote in ways that, uh, that undercut human rights, uh, that diminish our standing around the world, you know, that uh, endanger our national security because of their recklessness, we need to hold them to account. And I remind people all the time that I, you know, uh, you don't work for me, I work for you. And I think sometimes there's the role, there's a role mix up here uh, where, you know, some members of Congress think everybody works for them. Well, that's not the way it is. And, you know, if we, if we want a better country, um, we, we have to fight for it. I mean, and we want a better world, we're going to have to fight for it in a nonviolent way, by the way. I'm not, um, yeah, but I'll just say one other thing. Um, one of the things I've learned these last four years is that when people would say things that I thought were outrageous or beyond the pale, uh, when they would say things that, quite frankly, I might even have found to be just, you know, horrific. Um, you know, I, 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 I sometimes would have this view, well, you know, I'm not going to dignify that with a response because it's so awful. I'm not, I mean, it's so ridiculous. I'm not going to respond to it. After these last four years, I've learned can't do that anymore. Got to respond to everything. You know, I mean, we're having problems passing humane immigration law because we haven't responded to all the lies and misperceptions and you know, conspiracy theories that have been put for forward for years and years and years. I mean, if we don't respond to everything, then the lies, the distortions become viewed as reality. And I think that is especially important now. It is vital that we are engaged um, uh, with the international community. It is, it is vital that we, again, support and, uh, and defend institutions like the United Nations. So, but we're gonna to have to change some minds out there because some minds have been poisoned. Uh, and the way we change our mind, the change people's minds is we gotta speak up. And uh, so I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm responding to more things that I, than I used to respond to because I think it's important. I think you all do too. I and mean, we, can, we can change uh, the, uh, per, per, these perceptions. We can help educate people um, and we can in turn help create a better world. So I appreciate, you know, your dedication. Jordy, thank you for your questions. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I'm really grateful to have been on the call with all of you tonight. Well, Congressman, thank you. I, I can tell you, I've uh, got to respond to everything. It's, it's, it's got to be on a bumper sticker because that's, it's a great, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a rallying cry. It's a challenge, but you know, you're, you're, you're damn right. I mean, that's uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate your your time uh, allowing us to cover uh, so much ground here tonight, and and uh, and really appreciate your time uh, over the last uh, several decades in in championing these these issues again, both here and abroad. And uh, that's uh, it's incredibly important. And uh, that that pint of had the grass ice cream will be uh, will be sent again, and it's the springtime, so you get to, you get. Uh, but uh, I could probably pull some strings for uh, some of the winter flavors right now. But uh, thank thank you again, and uh, and and really appreciate your time. Thank you. All the best, everybody. Be safe. Thank you so much, Jordy. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us again. And I think the rallying cry for human rights from Congressman McGovern is exactly what we need to do. We need to stand up for all those recommendations that were made to the United States. There were over 340 recommendations and those 340 recommendations cover the civil and political rights that we all desire to see thrive in our democracy, but also economic, social and cultural rights. And we're so pleased to hear Congressman McGovern say health is a human right to recognize finally that economic, social, and cultural rights are absolutely essential for the future of our country. And so we know that what will happen very soon, uh, the Human Rights Council just started. It, was, uh, it began on Monday. 
And as Jordy said, uh, Secretary of State Blinken made a statement uh, just yesterday morning saying the U.S. will run for the Human Rights Council. That's exciting because now we have really a whole year campaign leading up to October to say if the U.S. is joining the council, they'll make pledges. And those pledges could be what we care about. And then for those three years on the council, we can push them for that to make sure that they can be human rights education champions. McGovern also said the right to a clean and healthy environment is a human right. We could then champion on climate justice as well, that we've seen that change with Kerry taking a leadership role in the exciting actions taking place so forward in the first 30 days. But what we need to concentrate on is what we do next. So between now and March 15th and 17th, when the agenda number six will feature the US adoption, what will happen on that day under agenda number six is for one hour, the US government will speak. We expect to sound a lot different than that November 9th hearing. And then they will accept or reject those recommendations. Those recommendations are really the recipe book for a moral architecture for a better America. Those recommendations are exactly what you shared with us throughout the years we prepared our stakeholder reports. And then what we need to do is figure out how we can then make sure that these recommendations become a reality and they, we have a culture of human rights in our country. So what we're doing is hashtag campaign, accept my recommendation. So if we let everyone know when you're sending out the recommendation you care about the most, that's because most people don't wanna read through a 300 plus recommendation and find those. So find your recommendation. If it's ratifying the CRC, if it's ratifying CDAW, please speak out and talk about that and say, accept my recommendation and send that to your city council and your mayor. Say, my city, my rights. Push that hashtag, my city, my rights. Also send recommendations to Congress saying, Congress, realize my rights, accept my rights, accept my recommendations. Those are all exciting aspects to raise awareness about the UPR because not everyone knows about the UPR yet. We're, we've done a lot of work in UNA USA so more people know about the UPR and that experience, but more people need to know. And I think that's what Representative McGovern was telling us. He agrees that we need the CRC to be ratified and us not be the only country. I agree when Jordy brought up the Convention on Rights with Persons with Disabilities, we should push for that and honor Bob Dole as was attempted. We need to stand up and make sure the members of Congress hear that we care about these rights. And the UPR happens every five years roughly so it is that health checkup on the human rights of our country. And it's a chance for us all to make sure that what we care about is definitely shared at the global level, but more importantly, as Eleanor Roosevelt says, that we bring it close to home where it matters most. And I wanna thank everyone for participating throughout the year and a half plus. And we will be one last time at New York. London and I are coordinating a side event with the UN missions in New York on March 5th. And then another event in Geneva, because we want to make sure that the recommendations you brought forward on election integrity, on climate justice, on LGBTQIA are actually made and accepted on March 15th through 17th. And then we'll begin working with Congressman McGovern as your elected officials as well. Reach out to them and say, please support these recommendations and let's make sure we take these international recommendations and make sure our national laws are in line. He also made great points about inviting the special rapporteurs who come and make excellent recommendations. And we need to really look at all of that. And everything was mentioned in the UPR. That's the exciting part. So we definitely look forward to partnering and continuing with you. Please do the accept my recommendation hashtag until the March 15th through 17th. And then we look forward to doing an exciting campaign launched probably at our global leadership event that London is spearheading that we'll be able to, when we're meeting virtually in DC and meeting again with Marco and Jordi, that we'll be able to see those recommendations and make sure that those become a reality. But we thank all of you for all of your work and making sure that human rights is a priority. And thank you for your moral courage to build a human rights movement in our country. I'll now hand it back to Katrina. Thank you, Katrina. Mahalo. 
Thank you so much, Joshua. And this fight for human rights is never ending, but ever still important. And with each fight we win, uh, our country becomes one step closer to living up to its full potential and to the promise uh, to its American people. So to take part in a very quick step to help fight for these rights, you can text HRC to 30644, and you'll be prompted to fill out a petition that will be sent urging President Biden to restore US leadership to ensure protection for human rights for everyone. And I also hope that you'll consider joining UNA USA if you aren't already a member. Our members, as you see here, care deeply about so many issues from human rights to education, gender equality and equity, climate action, sustainability, and more. So to join UNA USA, you can text UNA USA also to 30644, or just go to our website at unausa.org slash join. So I want to give a very last thank, thanks to all of our different speakers, as well as to all of you for joining us this evening. Stay safe and stay healthy. Aloha. Thank you, everybody. Thanks all. Good night. <laughs>